Tri-Cities Community Television presents the fifth and the final speaker series, Life Stories, put on by the Coquitlam Public Library. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amin. Welcome to our program today, Life Stories. Um, we acknowledge that Coquitlam Public Library provides service on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Swillitooth, Katsi, Musqueam, Kakai, Squamish and Stolo Nations. I'm welcoming everyone to our last session in our five part speaker series, Life Stories. We wanted to present real life stories of people from marginalized groups and how they have experienced prejudice, social exclusion, or stigma. By understanding and appreciating everyone's past and present, we can build a better future for all. We want to thank you for coming to this session. Um, tonight, we continue our series with the focus on newcomers and refugees. We are joined by Judith Obatusa, Nafis Amari, and Tian Li. Um, we welcome questions at the end of the presentation, um, so I'm just going to pass it along to Judith and we'll get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here to share my story. And um, because this is what makes me happy, I'm not just going to be sharing my story. I'm going to be challenging us to do things in a new way. And because I didn't plan to be holding a microphone, because I got my notes, because I don't want to miss, I mean, my story is long, it's traumatic, and there are parts of it that I'm not telling today, because we've got such a short time. I'm going to share a little bit about my Canadian immigration experience. And I've titled this talk, What I've Lived and What I've Learned. I remember the day that we received the email that we had gotten accepted to come to Canada as permanent residents. So exciting. The anticipation of the opportunity to give our children a better life. And the journey was good. You know, when you're traveling with such joy and such hope and dreams of the possibilities that are ahead of you, it's, it's very, very enjoyable. And so we got to Canada and exactly four weeks and four days after we got here, I lost my father and I became an orphan. Three days after I lost my dad, my children started school. I had one in high school, she started grade nine, two in elementary, and one in kindergarten. And then the trouble began. Bullying. Bullying, my daughter was told in her high school that the school was too white. And that the few blacks they had in the school were born in Canada. And so people like her didn't fit into the demographic for that school. And that the best thing for us was to move our daughter to another school. So that was the response of the school to the experience and the trauma my daughter was going through. And then in the elementary school, my boy who was nine, very happy person, was being bullied in class, outside during recess, and eventually that led to him being hospitalized. If you know a little bit about Canadian law, when you come in as a permanent resident, you don't get your health insurance immediately. So it takes some months. So by going to the emergency room, within that period when we hadn't received our, um, our health insurance, provincial health insurance, it meant that we're going to pay out of pocket. And when, you get, when we got there, they said, oh, don't worry, you pay later. And we didn't even understand the way things worked. Luckily for us, the doctor said, 
he, he said, don't worry about paying me. But by walking into the emergency, we had to leave. We were owing the, the city or the province $550. That came back to haunt me. And the very next, and, and the very next day, we went back to school because I'm from Nigeria. And Nigerians, we have education. And even if you were very sick, you would go to school. So instead of giving my son at home, I let him go to school. And when he got to school, I told them, don't let him play outside. Let him stay in the class during recess. And somehow on that day, the school decided that to distract me from my rights, I should get involved with the child welfare system. And for the next seven and a half years, my life was never the same. And when you get involved with the child welfare system, it comes with discrimination, it comes with stigma. Everywhere we went, when they find out that we are involved with the child welfare system, they become suspect. Whatever we say isn't true, they have to confirm from the child welfare system. And even people like me, other immigrants, felt better than me, because now I had the mark, the child welfare system. And so, the first few years of being in Canada, we didn't enjoy, I didn't enjoy, my children did not enjoy the experience of those new opportunities, the new sights, sounds, and tastes, because we had the child welfare system a shadow following us everywhere. So when I look back today, I think I was deprived of my children's upbringing. The thing that makes you a mom was taken away from me because I was busy chasing the shifting goalposts. Today, this thing I did is good. Tomorrow, it's not good enough. Why did you do that? You should do this way. Go for parenting classes, go for counseling. And that's what I did for the next seven and a half years. I worked from home. I got a job working from home, but I couldn't do as many hours because I was busy attending all these meetings. So this experience, the system-induced trauma, colored our settlement experience. But you know what? Because I cannot stay down in the dumps. And if I was going to live in this country that was now my home, I had left everything. I was now an orphan, and this was my new home. I needed to look beyond the situation and find the positive in the pain. And so I began to embrace everyone I met with positivity and every interaction that I had, I went in with curiosity. And because of that, I learned some things. So I'm going to share four negatives and four positives. The first thing that I, read, that I learned is something called racism. You see, I'm from Nigeria, now I'm Nigerian-Canadian, and Nigeria was one of those countries that helped South Africa when they were going through apartheid. So we knew a lot, of, we heard a lot about apartheid. I watched a lot of movies, I read a lot of books, I saw the bullying, but I didn't understand what racism was. Because here, my experience, what I learned about racism is that because of the color of your skin, people could be mean to you. Because of the color of your skin, people could assume the worst about you and determine to punish you or make life difficult for you just because you're not the same race as they are. I also learned something else called systemic racism. That there was a, there was systemic empowerment for those who were mean to you. That if you needed a service, you could be deprived of that service because you colored differently, or you be, or could, you could be getting that service at a lower standard than someone else. I learned that this system disempowers you 
because of your race. And assumptions like the quality of parents that you are are determined by the system. Assumptions like being a black boy means that you're violent are used to determine how you're treated. The third thing that I learned, the third negative that I learned, is the systemic racism in schools. So if you send your son to school, you expect him to go and learn the ABCs and the one, two, threes. But because of this thing in the school, you are running the risk of ruining your relationship with your child. You are also running the risk of, of messing up your child's well-being. Because a racist teacher or administrator can just sit down and become an armchair psychologist and diagnose things about your child that could cost you your child. The fourth thing that I learned is that it doesn't matter how you came to Canada, whether you're a permanent resident, you're a refugee, or you just run through the borders on a lie. We are all immigrants. We are all people of color. It doesn't matter. And these things were things that impacted my life. But then, in these negatives, I learned some positives. And those negatives are just four that I listed. They're not all the negatives. But I'm going to share four positives, too, that I learned because of the negatives. So the one thing that I learned is that I am not powerless. You know, I have the power to choose to accept your idea about me. I have the power to accept your label. What you said about me that I am not a good parent, it's my choice to accept it. You see, when people give you a gift until you accept it, you don't receive it. You see, one of my, my family service worker in the child welfare system told me, there was a day I was weeping because that day they had decided we're going to take my son from me. Not because I did anything, but because we had gotten into the system and he had spent a particular number of years and based on the law, he had to be taken away and become a child of the crown. And that wasn't why I brought my first son to Canada with my money. And I was crying and she said, you are not powerless. That woman taught me <coughs> that I had power. Just like that child who his father said, sit down there. And the boy said, daddy, even though I'm sitting down, I'm actually standing up inside. And I'm standing up inside to say no to your labels, to say no to the negatives that you want to be upon me and on my children. So I'm not powerless, and none of us is powerless. We have a choice to internalize the lies, the negatives, or to reject them. The second thing I learned is that a strong family can withstand all storms. One of the things I found out about the child welfare system is when the child welfare system enters your family, the first thing they are looking at is the relationship between the two adults. If there is a problem in that relationship, they're going to be there for a long time. And that got me into talking about domestic violence. That is my passion. I don't want any immigrant to go through what I've gone through. Because today, I bear the scars. My children bear the scars of our experiences. But if every mom and dad, every parent that migrates to this country with their children, can understand that when you come to Canada, the culture is different that what was acceptable in our countries is not acceptable here. That even though your wife was not complaining, this system makes her very sensitive to your relationship. And that children don't learn what you say. 
they learn what they see. When they see respect in the home, they'll learn it. And no matter what they are told in school or wherever, when they come home and it's a safe space, it makes a whole lot of difference to how they accept those learnings or teachings they're getting outside. And because of our parents, and because of our relationships as adults, not being as strong as it should be, it creates a weak foundation for our children. And the system is ready to lay hold on it and use it <coughs> against you. I also learned under the issue of family that love is an action word. It's not a word that you say, it's a word that you do. And one thing about love is service. Actually, what service does is that service sweetens the home. When mom is serving dad, dad is serving mom, children can see and you're serving one another, there is peace in that kind of home. And I'm going to go into the fourth thing that my experience in Canada has taught me. I mean, the third thing, there are allies everywhere. Not everyone from the lineage of a colonizer is a racist. Some of them are just plain ignorant. For example, someone who tells me that, is Africa, who asks me, is Africa a country in Europe? That's plain ignorance. And she went on to say so many things that cost her her job because of her ignorance. And so we shouldn't come into these spaces ready to fight because some people are just plain ignorant. And so I'm going to the issue of service because if there's anything that has empowered me in this country, it's the power of service. One of the things I do today is I'm a host and a producer of a podcast where I share the stories of women's resilience through chaos, crisis, and the challenges of life. And why do I talk to women and talk about women? Because the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And the Bible tells us that the man is the head of the family. But do you know we, the women, we are the neck? If the neck is not moving, the head is going nowhere. <laughs> so the power is in us, and it's important that we are able to see that no matter what we're going through, there's someone who has gone through it and she's come through well, and you will come through okay too. And so, on one of my episodes, maybe three weeks ago, the lady was a migrant to Malawi. And while she was in Malawi, she was a full-time housewife who traveled with her husband everywhere. She was very unhappy about the fact that she could not have a career, but by service, she found her purpose. So the power of service is such an amazing power that many of us are not harnessing it. And as immigrants to this nation, if we can harness it, it will make a whole lot of difference. That is so important to this nation that even the high schoolers have to have certain hours of volunteering to graduate. So, the first thing I did was I joined the parents' council because I got to, I had to get to the table where decisions are made. Those decisions that impact our children in school, they are made at those meetings. So I joined parent council. It's not easy. Some people are professional parent council members, and every time they see someone new coming, they want to push you up. They actually did that to me in one of my children's schools. But of course, the next year I was on parent council again, because I was determined to have a voice. Because when you serve, it gives you a voice at the table. You can lend your voice to decisions, and that's how we create change in the system. It is in community service that you can help, I talked about that, changing the system by lending your voice. And when you volunteer, it does something to you. You learn about the culture. 
Let me tell you one example of something that I learned. I was on the SNAP team for our school, my children's school. It was when I joined the parent council, I was in my SNAP team, that I saw a fruit called cantaloupe. I'd never seen it before. <laughs> and they made me taste it. And then I started buying it for my kids. By relating with those women, I learned about the culture. When you volunteer, when you serve in community, you learn about the culture. You help other people and they learn about you. Most of those tables, I am the only black person. They don't know about me. Many of the immigrants here have, been, have lived in Europe, South America. They've lived in Africa, they've lived in different places. They're bringing all that wealth of knowledge and experience to these tables. So by not stepping into our spaces on those tables, we're depriving this community of what we have to offer. And by coming to those spaces, the community gets to know who we are. They get to know that black people don't all live. And in fact, I don't know anybody who lives on a tree. You know? They get to understand that speaking good English isn't all you need to be smart and to be a good engineer. Because we are at those tables. One other thing that service does for us is it is in community that you find those allies I talked about. I'm going to tell you about my friend Lisa. I met her while serving. Lisa was a white woman who was raised in the city where I was living at the time. And Lisa was the reason that eventually, one of the big reasons that the child welfare system went to court and told them she's a good woman and gave me back my son after seven and a half years of fighting. Lisa would attend every meeting with me. We would schedule meetings together. She would go to school with me. She would go to the child welfare office with me. She, reach, she reached out to people she knew, who she grew up with, who were now in big uh, positions in the society and they could speak to the situation. Writes emails to MPs for me. Lisa was my ally and she fought the battle with me. So there are people in community who are waiting to meet you if you are an immigrant. To stand with you and help you to be the best that you're meant to be by coming here. They're not here by coincidence. We're actually here by divine design. We may think we did it ourselves. Another thing about service is you come to service and you're real. You are too busy thinking about the person you want to help to be putting up a facade. And you know, when we come there real, what do we do? We help build our communities into places where being black Asian or any other color is just being human and you are a person worthy of respect, you're worthy of justice, and you're worthy of love. And one thing about service, service means a lot to me because it changed my life. It brings you into purpose. How did I become a domestic violence peer advocate? Somebody invited me to serve on a project at a nonprofit, and it turned out to be a nonprofit. That project was funded by the Immigrant Refugee IRCC, Citizenship Canada. And I ended up eventually serving even up to. Uh, Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants in that role. And because of that role, and now that's my thing. Everybody knows Judith is all about domestic violence among immigrants. It will help you find your place in life. So if you are an immigrant here today, please keep showing up. If you are not an immigrant, and you were the one who welcomed us to Canada, also keep showing up. Because when we show up, we make our communities 
place that is inclusive and welcoming to all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Judith. That was very moving. Um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Nafis. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nafise. I'm so happy that I have the opportunity to share my story with all of you um, today. Um, I'm originally from Iraq, and I was born in um, Iran during the Iran Iraq War in the city of Kermanshah, which is located in the western part of Iran and was harsh, harshly damaged during the war. Uh, being a ch child of a war was difficult. I still remember the, those dark days. You know, the frequent piercing cry of uh, a raid siren um, and warnings of impending air strike. However, the most painful memory for me was the time that my um, classmate returned to school after a long absence with a bandaged face and extreme permanent scar um, as a result of very severe, severe burn injuries uh, because of the deliberate bombing in, in the urban areas. Uh, in that time, each time I played with my friend, I promised myself that I will find an effective treatment for burn scar when I grow up. My fascination with finding new treatments to improve lives was the most powerful motivation for me to pursue a career as a pharmacist. Uh, scoring among the top 0.1% in the Iranian University in Trans Exam, which is very competitive, I was accepted in one of the best pharmacy schools in Iran, and I started my education as a student of pharmacy. After my education, I worked as a pharmacist for a few days, and in those few years, actually, in, in those years, I was as a uh, volunteer pharmacist in a retirement home. Uh, I met many patients suffering from chronic wounds, different kind of chronic wounds, such as diabetic foot ulcer, pressure ulcer, and I realized that in addition to burn the scar, there are still lots of challenges to the successful treatment of chronic wounds. And although the old like shelves of pharmacies are full of colorful packages and creams for a treatment of wounds, and effective affordable therapies are still needed. However, there are a um, small number of scientists and research center or working uh, on this field. <laughs> okay, so um, I decided to go back to school to investigate more about the wound healing process and work on finding a real treatment for the hard to heal more. Right third among about 20 hundred participants, I was awarded the Iran Ministry of Health and Medical Education through the scholarship from a PhD program. During my PhD, when it was time to choose a topic for the thesis, while most of the students was choosing cancer research, which was a kind of established field of research in our institute, I entered the emerging field of tissue engineering and started to work on skin um, regeneration to find a way to, um, to find out actually how we can reconstruct the function and structure of the skin and how to find a way, actually a real uh, solution for all of this problem that we have in the burn and with the like hard to heal bones. Um, working in a very new field of study was very hard and I had to build the whole lab actually from scratch. Um, setting up new equipment and experiments and repeating everything thousands of times and waking, waking and staying awake nights after nights to get the result um, was what I actually went through in that, those days. It was hard but um, it was also a great experience for me. Uh, 
because you know, a few years later, I uh, left an established life in my country and moved to a new country to build a new life from scratch. Uh, after finishing my PhD, uh, the excitement of learning new techniques and acquiring better insight to the whole process of healing and you know, still working on uh, wound treatment motivated me to apply for postdoctoral fellowship in Bern Wound Healing Research Lab at UBC. Uh, I accepted the challenge of leaving Iran and moving to a new country with small kids, not only to pursue my uh, education and research, but also to, left the, to leave the society where um, women confront lots of legal and social barrier, and to leave my dream of being an independent, powerful woman in science. Speaking about Iran, I want to talk few words, let's say a few words about what's happening in Iran right now, which is, you know, hard. Um, Iran has been rocked by the biggest protest in years following the death of the young uh, woman, Mahsa Gina Amini, on September 16. She was only 22 years and her murder by so-called morality police for not wearing the job appropriately sparked uh, women's protest across Iran. Uh, they're not only uh, fighting for the right to choose how they dress and express their identities, but also to put an end to years of oppression and dictatorship. Women start this wave of protest, but everyone else joined. Iranians now, Iran Iranians of all ages, ethnicity and gender, have taken to streets, risking their life, chanting woman life freedom, demanding an an end to this like brutal dictator regime. Long the story shows, you know, Iranian people make their choice to fight for their freedom, and I think now it's our turn to support them and be their voice to get what they really deserve. Anyway, back to my story. When I came to Canada in uh, 2019, um, although I had the the privilege of having family here, which was a huge help to me to settle down. I faced different challenges, which I had to find a way to deal with them all by myself. You know, each individual always have their own individual challenges and issues. And you know, that's, you know, starting the pandemic, many new novel challenges popped up that, you know, was new to everyone. And it was very hard hard especially for the newcomers. Um, not returning to my country and leaving everything here at that time was a tough decision for me. But I think sometimes in a lot of you have to make hard decisions to go and facilitate a better future. Having suffered from discrimination and injustice in addition to my scientific activity, I try to be an advocate for social justice and active member of the community. I think when when you see when you feel that something needs to be changed, you should go for it and not wait for the others to change all those kind of things for you. So that's why when I uh, find out that immigrant advisory table, Tri City Immigrant Advisory Table. Uh, is looking for a new member, I immediately apply for that. Uh, immigrant advisory table is consists of individuals who represent a range of countries of origin, length of time in Canada, different background, ages, genders, you know, and various other forms of diversity. They they gathering together to provide provide advice to service providers and governments from inside they got from their experience and need as a newcomer. So in March 2020, I joined the Tri-City Immigration Advisory Table to make the community more welcoming for newcomers and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Being a member of Immigrant Advisory Table, I have learned a lot about the new community I joined. I've learned a lot about different culture, different people. I 
met many different people from like all over uh, the different countries. And uh, it was a great opportunity for me to share my stories and experiences. As, as Judith said, I find out that there are many people out there that are ready to help you. So if you need help, it's good to go and ask. Um, so far when I look back to my life, I think that I uh, have gotten, I have successfully have gotten through the different challenges that I faced. And, you know, uh, I'm at a good point now. I, I know that I haven't found a magic treatment for both yet, but I'm moving forward and I'm working on that. Hopefully I can get to that one day. Um, I, my story um, starts in war. I'm very hopeful that it will end in peace. Not for just for me, but like for the whole world. Thank you, the peace. That was great. I will be welcoming our next speaker, Tian. Hello. So, sorry, I'm not Chinese, I'm Vietnamese. Oh, oh, so, oh, yeah, so no. no problem, we have. <laughs> but Xin Chiao in Vietnam, because I'm Vietnamese. And uh, hello everyone, my name is Tian Chui Le, and um, I'm currently the coordinator of special projects for the Société of Développement Économique à la Colombie Britannique which is, is a non-profit organization in French speaking. So that's why English is not my first language. So if I have any accent, so please be feel free because it's a French accent as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today I will tell you about my story. So a story for a little girl from a far, far away country which is in Vietnam, where traditional and culture value are always appreciated. Um, a girl who for more than 30 years old of her life has always such good uh, with traditional value and prejudice and trying to accept her own value as well as walking slowly, slowly between a boundary of reality and a dream. And uh, a story that for any girl, any woman uh, in this room maybe uh, can easily uh, encounter in her life. So firstly, I would like to ask, how many women are there in this room? Please raise your hand. Okay, okay, Jesus, more So, thank you very much. And how many of you are female immigrants in Canada? Wow, oh, thank you so much. May I ask one question, so one last question. How many of you, you female immigrants, have been rejected, have been judged? or deny just because you are women. Please raise your hand. So thank you very much. So I see that among the you, uh, they have many people from the starting point just like me. So my story starts when I was six years old, uh, when my mother used to study in France. So um, according to my family traditionals, I go to also to French school and learn French since I'm six years old. And, um, and then um, in 1997, I had the opportunity to represent um, the Vietnamese student for the 7-7 Francophonie Summit in Hanoi, which brought uh, together 49 members and uh, country and territory in all other parts of the world. So it was also the first time I understood that the Francophony community is not including French people. And also I understand that 
the war is bigger than I'm thinking about. And uh, when I travel, you know, um, I come for the first time in France uh, for an Asian student program for five weeks. And in this trip, I decided to go back to France to study. And at the age of 18, I chose to combine what I was bad at and what I was most passionate about uh, to study in France. So I chose to study, wait for it, fashion, <laughs> culture, and lifestyle management. It's like a current dreaming. Every girl in here has come to Paris to study in France. It's every girl dream. So, <laughs> and um, and with the hope that in the future I can establish a social enterprise in fashion to preserving a national value to embroidering uh, in the modern design to Vietnamese uh, traditional value and also to create you for more, uh, for also for many more women in my hometown. So this is my dream. So I stay in Paris to study and work for six years. And along my graduate study in France in order uh, to have many more people. So I have actively uh, participated in um, Vietnamese student associations in France. And when I'm reaching in Vietnam to work also in fashion luxury industry, I also join uh, the executive commitment of the Vietnamese uh, alumni uh, for French students in Vietnam. But in 2016, um, the flows killed and destroyed a thousand of houses in Quang Binh, Vietnam. This is a province in Vietnam. So our associate have volunt volunt uh, volunteered to uh, visit each teacher's village, uh, each beloved family in the province. And that trip is a work, something in me. And since I told, uh, since then my life has completely changed forever. I have switched from a professional career associate with fashion's luxury industry uh, to the career to community support and development uh, corporations. So moreover, promoting culture and also community activities uh, and connections, especially uh, like that, uh, is not only my passion, but also um, something my career won forever. I was since I, I was studying France. And the first day, when I decided to give up my current job in the high positions, good salary in the fashion industry, and benefit to become an unpaid internship for the UNESCO Department uh, of Ministry of French Affairs in Vietnam, was the one of the hardest day of my life. When I share my, uh, my thinking, my dream, my dream with my family and my friends, um, and uh, just I wanting to help people, I commitment to make society more just, everyone more happy, uh, no one supporting me, no one. No one, even my parents. So, but I understand. I understood this time because for Vietnamese society and culture, giving up finance and <coughs> social status uh, to live an unemployment um, is a questionable thing. Uh, since a mid crease of uh, 25 years old, since all the time, and the social worker sector. Um, that what I pursue, pursuing uh, at this time, what must really develop in Vietnam. And it took me a lot of time to confirm my ability and positions become before coming to Canada. When everyone told me, 
You cannot do it, Tian. You are so crazy. Well, what do you have in your mind? Why, why do you want to leave your, your work? For what? For, for doing internship in UNESCO? Well, what do you want? You want to save people? You want crazy man. Yeah, Tian is crazy. And um, I went to uh, the loneliness, the hardest time in my life. And when even my family and my close friend were both unsupporting from the world. And, but the only thing is if it means this time, this is a growing myself, a growing myself, which is different about the fixed myself. Because the fixed myself is having a view of things that offer very little variations in what is possible in favor of standard response. And with only a growing mindset and a strong belief in yourself and a desire to take action to change the world for the better way, I move forward slowly day by day. I still remember when I have to sell all my belonging closer ride a bicycle from my school, or borrow my brother's motorbike when he has started about to go in for work. I work as a speaker, a coordinator, a host for a small committee program in the city for free. <clears throat> and gradually, my presentations and my talk show become more known. And I was paid for the first time 2,000 Vietnamese dong. Do you know 2,000 Vietnamese dong is how much in Canada? It's 25 Canada. For the first time, for one hour and a half. This is my first day for my career, so I, I keep very close to this two, 25 dollar in my pocket. <laughs> so I start to have the first soft skill training contract Signed the contract to work with the first international um, organization such as uh, a French international industry or the French embassy. And like many immigrants in here, as the first time, immigrant uh, and living in Canada was something beyond my dream. It's not real. And um, it's just imaginations. And a lot of people taught me that you have to pay your document. You have to marry someone. You have to pay for your school life, for going for immigrant to Canada. And or do you have a fake wedding or buy a paperwork? And in shop, again, I don't have any money. I can. So, but I did believe. I believe I belong in this country because one time I saw in the publicity, in the television, one the program immigration of Canada, but not like any other country. In the end of this uh, commercial, they say, please come and join to our community. The word community is touching me. So they say, please come to my house. Please join with us. We are one community. We are one uh, country. We are Canada. So that kind of thing is touching in deep down in my heart that I want to live in this country, that I believe that I belong in this community, the community of immigrants, the community of diversity, but also the community of unique but solidarity value. So I decided to uh, going uh, to Canada with my husband uh, by um, a study abroad uh, applications. But lucky for me, my applications have rejected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lucky. <laughs> yes, this is my. I say. Yeah, so lucky I have rejected. For some reason, I have my applications for in the big 
of COVID epidemic in Vietnam. So every every visa in this time is have been registered because in Vietnam is high number of COVID. And then, however, once again, I did not give up. <laughs> I cried out, know, and then next day I said, "So Tian, you have to accept this situation. You have to pass by." Or you have to accept that yeah, you fail and you stay in Vietnam. It's a reality. You can cry. But it's just, sometimes it's just life. And then I have always considered life events, including challenge, as opportunity to learn, expand and grow in the new way, create a new possibility, and in invite explorations of new directions of action. And that's the growth mindset I was talking about. <laughs> I did my own research on the conditions of French speaking and submit the, my applications again three years, one week after. And after three weeks, I get approved. <laughs> I get approved. And that's thanks to the International Mobility Program and also uh, Jessica Roger, who is unfortunately is not here today. He, she's my Sri Lanka director with my, a big warm heart, uh, who is also who is the first person who believes in my potentials and ability. And uh, I joined to the friend Kofoni minority in 2021, which is one year ago, and um, as the special project coordinator as a non-profit organization in the French community. And um, instead of taking more than two years of schooling, paying every bill, and yeah, just going everywhere for, for searching money to working, for, this is a long way, and instead, um, we we are sponsored to go here like high quality immigrant, so this is like a chance for us to change our life forever. So my job now is not just promoting the French community uh, in British Columbia, but also to promote the integration, promote the diversity, promote the immigration, our different value in here. And I'm so very proud to be standing here today as a member of TCLIF Immigration Advisor Table. Thank you, Natasha, Timothy, and also all the equipe of success. Um, and last August, I was selected to be the young Francophony Ambassador for the America. <laughs> and I also developed um, my side career as a speaker for the Metropolitan Francophone Mondial Conference and a girl speaker for IRCC, uh, you can submit by AMSA. And every day I keep up the habit of getting up early at uh, 7 a.m., praying, saying gratitude to the world, and meditation to clear my mind. For us, meditations and living mindfulness are an indis indispensable spiritual culture in daily life. And this is one thing my husband teaching me. What you give to the world, they will give back to you. Mm -hmm. I also try to keep a journal of thinking. I don't and I have done or chosen on weekly basis. I believe that no matter what life gave to me, no matter what, I will always accept and be grateful. And as well, try to make every action, every work, everything I do in my life being significant and bring happiness to everyone. Also my work today. <laughs> And I hope that my story inspires uh, other immigrants, especially uh, women who are suffering under prejudice and under pressure, like social pressure, to be brave 
in a to until the not of yourself. And I believe that deep in within every human being have a good, good value, infinity potential, but sometimes, sometimes just because we are too afraid, too worried, uh, too afraid by judgment of those people all around us. And this is what we deny the ourselves, we deny the possibility, and we deny our desire of happiness. And do not assimilate uh, what do you feel about the situations. Please do not assimilate about that with the reality of your life. Do not assimilate what do you feel about the situations or about the happening to your life with the reality. The most important thing is about our behavior, our reactions when we get into these situations. And we can never change the past, but we can create the future. And for those who are constantly stripping for the better life, you are not alone, incompetent, or weak. I hope you cherish any loneliness, time, or suffering, such grief, because that's the most unexpected, most creative, most beautiful, and wonderful thing will come to you at the end that you, you did not expect. And for me, uh, remember, you are the God most precious and wonderful gift. And thank you so much for your listening. This is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tian. I am going to now open it up, open up the questions for every um, for everyone. Um, maybe I'll get this, uh, Judith, uh, Tian, and Nafis to come to the front so you have, everyone has the opportunity to ask some questions. Is there any questions anybody would like to ask our speakers today? Doesn't seem like we have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. I, oh, yes, there's some questions. Yeah, so yes. I have a question. So, Thank you so much for all your stories. It was really amazing um, just to witness and hear your immigration stories and how you develop your new life in Canada. Just wondering for, as an immigrant, um, I guess I'm always afraid of public speaking because you know sometimes when I go to a meeting or when I have to present myself, it can be not graphic because it, it's not my first language. So I sometimes think a lot. So do you guys have any tips in terms of public speaking or what do you guys do usually to improve your public speaking? It's because I'm standing there to 10. Fashion. <laughs> stand beside a, a professional fashionist and everything starts falling down. <laughs> um, for me, I talked about being real. Every time I'm, I have the privilege of sharing myself with others, it is a real privilege. I don't take it lightly. But I come as I am. If you were to talk to me one on one, this is the same way. I'm very passionate about what I value and what I believe. So if I were to give you a tip, it would be be yourself. You see, there's something about this English of a thing. You know, when I came to Canada, I actually thought I spoke very good English until I came to Canada. <laughs> and it was your accent. They say it so nicely. It's such a beautiful and unique accent. It, it took a while for me to get, the, to get the message. It took me years, actually, to understand what it meant by that. But the truth is that we all have accents. The Newfoundlander has an accent that's totally different from the person who is from Quebec. And for many immigrants, their greatest fear is speaking in 
in public. Some even say speaking one-to-one -one scares them because they are scared that their English is imperfect. English is just another language. And I really love Canada for that. You don't have to be perfect in English. Like I speak and people say, what did I say? I repeat, 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 repeat. Just don't lose your cool. If you have to repeat, repeat. They didn't understand. And if you don't speak English like your mother tongue, that's that. Those who love you, who want to hear you speak, they will gain what they want. And even if you spoke the best English and you're the queen of England, those who don't love you won't hear you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, okay. um, for me, like, and, uh, yeah, I, I say like an easier people, we have uh, a lot of ch traditional to uh, care about judging. Uh, this is our traditional because we are communists and uh, a lot of people that we must be the same uniform. But I, um, my starting is when I seen um, Jimmy O. Yang, <laughs> a comedian, uh, a Chinese comedian, was speaking. It's very easy about the problem with parents. As I say, I say, why not? Why I cannot say normally? And then I am a French speaking. So normally, when you ask French speaking and you speak English, you are more judging from by people than uh, other, other persons who speak English. But I say, yeah, okay, I have accent. I come from uh, Vietnam. I live in different country. But in here, we are anyone, any person in this, uh, in this world. It's different. It's beautiful in that world. And maybe my work Maybe my presentations, maybe uh, my talk, uh, when touching, is some way in beauty way for maybe some uh, one heart. So that is what I think, and then I do not scare to sharing what I what I want to talk. Yeah. Something. <laughs> How they actually uh, said the old thoughts. You know, as the Judith said, the first step is accepting you and the way you're talking. And the rest is the stress of public speaking. It doesn't matter if you're speaking in English or no. Other languages, always there are stress. And there are some, some techniques to, you need to practice and practice. And as a pharmacist, I know a pill that can help you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want the name. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, is there any specific group of immigrants with specific challenges that you want to support, or you know, you could address any challenges in any, any different? Okay, let me explain. We are not addressing challenges. Mm -hmm. We speak to those who make, who help immigrant settlement. We tell them our experiences, we share, they ask us questions. TCLIP has facilitated these conversations, these collaborations, these opportunities to connect with immigrants so that when an organization, for example, that is a settlement organization or even an employer of labor who employs immigrants, wants to make a decision, they have the right information. Because let me tell you something, for example, when it comes to employing an immigrant, the CEO doesn't know my experience. He doesn't even do the, the hiring. But TCLIP is facilitating these conversations, these opportunities for them to hear from us. So they do not develop programs to create change for us but they facilitate the connection that brings us to those places where decisions are being made that will impact every immigrant. 
so uh, we're part of TSLIP, and if anyone is interested, I mean, we are the staff board. Uh, if anyone is interested in no, uh, learning more about us, I'm happy to um, stay uh, after and answer a few questions and share my contact with you. Sure. And yeah, absolutely, please reach out. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Sir. Can I ask a question? Okay. Thank you so much to our speakers. You're just so awesome. Oh my God. Um, but my question is, um, from an immigrant perspective, when we come into Canada, we have a lot of expectations. So we think about a lot of things that can go really well and a lot of things that can might not go so well, but maybe we don't consider them so much because we choose to you know, move. But um, I was wondering, uh, what was one thing, and it can be, it can be like anything, because uh, sometimes we, ex we expect something really deep from this, and sometimes it's uh, something very silly, but what was, was one thing that it were well two things that you were not expecting. One that was not so good that you were, that you arrived here and you were like, Oh, I didn't see that coming. Oh my god. And the other thing that was like, Oh my god, this is such a good surprise. I wasn't expecting that I would find this here. Thank you. Okay, let's start with the the first one, the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, I experienced, it was very strange for me, is that child education here, not the system, but you know, in BC, when you are coming to um, BC, if your parents, they look at your parents, and if you, the parents doesn't have a um, status for one year, your child is not gonna fund it for the school, okay? Even if that child is born, I mean, was born in Canada and, and is Canadian. So it's very strange. Even some of the Canadians, you know, they actually surprised by this. When, you know, the, the whole world are just promoting the free education, this is a, this was a bit strange for me, you know. Uh, even if a child can come to Canada with their parents and want to stay like less than six, less than a year for six months, what the parents should do with that child? Can they keep them at home? They're, you know, there's not like that old parents could afford like sixteen thousand to send the kids to school. So this this not free education for everyone was a bit uh, strange for me. But in the other way, I had lots of ex like good experience. I can I can say the rest was actually good. And and you know another very good things was when I had a kind of this kind of problem with my child education. And then then I uh, went back to the border, and the officer kindly helped me to like change the document. I mean, give me the document that I needed, and then I get back and could register that. So that was my experience. Uh, for me, uh, the first thing I think about is about when a French speaking going to the English speaking <laughs> <laughs> province <laughs> it is unexpected. <laughs> it's not like you go to Quebec, but indeed, if I go to Quebec, I do not know if I understand in, in this line in French. And also, um, when I go to Canada, because I, I think it, because it's too cold, it's very hard, and maybe for the culture, it's very hard to develop um, a relationship. It's, it's not an open, more open like every day go out to the restaurant and French people when I eat first. Every restaurant is go to a, it's one p.m. one a.m. <laughs> And this here is very different. The, the reef of light is different. The, the fresh is different because the surprise is so high. So everyone is so uh, under the pressure to walking, walking a lot, to pay the bill, to every everything is coming. And um, <clears throat> when I come here uh, directly to my gun from my country, I walking directly in my organization. So I don't have time to like make an adjustment. I don't have time to like, well, wait, I'm, I'm so stressed was I just going work well, day by day, go through the, uh, so, so much of thing to do. But I found an uh, important table. And uh, this is one of uh, unexpected good thing. 
uh, I see in here is a lot of community to support, and also I work for the organization to support the immigrant. Uh, so it's a very beautiful team. They have so much community to support, to help each other. And one of the most, the most beautiful thing that I feel did and this expected when I come in Canada is the nature. Because I feel, if I feel so stressful, if I feel so stressed now, my 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 mind, I just go to the nature. And it's the it's healing me. So I think this maybe we must to focus what we have in here. It's so beautiful thing. It's so beautiful gift we have in here. If I come back to my country, if we don't have enough nature and enough environment. That is beautiful. That is healing yours very, very good for your mental health and just like here. So I appreciate that and I feel very grateful to be here in Canada. So, um, the, the, worst, the most shocking thing for me was the fact that children were encouraged to, to not be with their parents. I used to think that being a parent was a gift from God. That's the most shocking thing, and I still haven't gotten over that shock. If despite the research that shows that when you separate people from their family, you're negatively impacting them, the government actually funds a system that does that, that alienates parents. That's the most shocking thing, because if I take it back to Nigeria, if you have a struggling child, then maybe an uncle will take that child and help you look after the child. And when, you're, when the child is with your uncle, the uncle is telling the child how important their parents are. They never take them and tell them your parents don't count. You don't need your parents. That's the most shocking thing. Then the, the thing that I see that's very good in Canada is the social welfare or social safety net. When, you, when, we, when we have holidays, how people who can afford meals, how they are taken care of, how there are so many organizations seeking to help those who are less privileged. I think it's amazing and for example, if a child, a young girl gets pregnant in Canada, she will get help. In some other countries, if you got pregnant and you're a teenager, that's going to be the beginning of your device in your life. So the social safety net here is really wide and really tight. And that's so wonderful. Despite all my gory tales of, <laughs> but that's very important to me because I'm a mom, you know? Losing the love of your children is the most painful thing you can do to a parent for no reason. And despite all of that, there's still a lot of good in this country. And like I said, we're not here by a mistake or coincidence. We're actually here by divine design. Thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. It's uh, 8 o'clock now, so I'm just going to say thank you for our speakers, wonderful speakers today. And thank you to everyone who asked questions and for everyone who came today, and to all previous um, of our speaker series. And uh, hopefully everyone has had a good evening, and thank you for coming.